introduce myself. My name is Tatiana Guznaeva. I'm a senior consultant at Technopolis Group. And we are one of the partners in this uh, Pillars project. And uh, the work package which we are leading focuses on the co-design of policies for inclusive labor markets. We would like to ensure that the benefits of technological tra transformation as well as globalization generally are more widely shared in the society. And also we would like to support policy makers in mitigating negative effects uh, that, that also create further inequality because of the technological transformation. So, as I mentioned, we lead this work package in collaboration with the expert stakeholder group on uh, future technologies, skills, and labor markets. And uh, some members of this group are present today in this audience and uh, also watching us online right now. So I would like to give, uh, take this opportunity to also thank them for their contribution to this project and for, for their valuable input. And the next two sessions of this conference will uh, focus on the presentation and discussion of strategies, policies, instruments, and uh, initiatives that are dealing with the impact of technological transformation on the labor market and stimulate an inclusive transition in the EU. So in these two panels, we will look at various approaches uh, of policymakers that aim, on the one hand, to support technological transformation, smart specialization, to ensure availability of jobs, and on the other hand, to reduce inequality, provide opportunities for human development, and to ensure decent working conditions, as well as to prevent social tensions. The first session will focus on the EU perspective. This is why our panelists will include representatives of DG Connect, DG Employment, European Investment Bank, and Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Uh, we would like to discuss relevant strategies, policies, initiatives that have been launched at the EU level, and also to highlight and further discuss uh, some uh, topics, challenges, uh, priorities that are currently discussed at EU institutions related to this topic of inclusive labor markets. Each speaker will give a short presentation and following that we will have a panel discussion on this stage. And uh, I would also like to encourage our audience here as well as our participants who are watching us online on the live stream to pose their questions. So, this audience will be given a chance to ask their questions directly, while participants who are watching us online, we would like to encourage them to put their questions on Slido. And for this purpose, let me try to find it. Oops. Yeah. So for this purpose, I would like to invite our participants who are watching us online to put their questions on Slido. For this purpose, please go to slido.com and insert the code 2999660. You can also see it now on the screen. I switched it on. You can also have a QR code. Maybe that is easier. 2999660. So throughout the conference, just please feel free to put your questions there. And uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome at this stage our first speaker within our first panel, which focuses on the EU perspective, is Arthur Tregier. Arthur is a policy assistant at the Digital Economy Recovery Plan and Skills Unit at DigiConnect, European Commission. Today, Arthur will present the initiatives of his unit in advancing digital skills in the EU to improve the inclusion in the labor market. So please give a well welcome to Arthur. Well, good, good morning, everyone. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, for the introduction, and, and thank, you, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Um, so yeah, as you said, I'm going to speak about what we are doing for, for digital skills in DigiConnect, uh, and I will have this specific focus on advanced digital skills because this is basically what we are doing uh, in DigiConnect, or at least this is what we are focusing on. Um, so yeah, very quickly, just an outline of my presentation. I will give 
I will start with just a few data. I don't want to give you too much data, but I think it's important to, to know exactly what we are speaking about. Then I will explain that for digital skills, we have this very, very strong political support from the, from the highest uh, management in the commission. And then I will speak about the, the funding we have, the available funding, and what we are doing actually to finance uh, digital skills training, digital skills opportunities, etc. Then, in the last part, I will speak about working together, because really, this is something we truly believe in. Uh, alone, the European Commission, our public government, we, we can't tackle the gap uh, that we have for, for digital skills. And really, we need to work with, with businesses, we need to work with industry, we need to work with, with academia, etc. So, this is very quickly uh, the outline of my presentation. So, as I said, where we are in terms of, of digital skills, and, and what you can see on, on these few graphs is that actually we are very far from, from reaching the targets that we have set for ourselves. So, in the Digital Decade Communication, which was published two years ago, in March 2020, we have three targets which are equally important. We have the one on basic digital skills, because we really believe, and I think we have all witnessed this, that today, we need basic digital skills if we want to thrive in, in, in today's society, if you, if you want to find a job, if you want to just being able to interact with, uh, with people, if you want to, to be able to access, I don't know, news online, etc. So really, these are the basic digital skills, and we are relatively far from the targets that we set. So in some countries, for example, in the Netherlands, in, in some Baltic countries, in, in some uh, Scandinavian countries as well, we are approaching these targets, whereas in some other countries, we are very far. And in total, in average, we are still at 54%, which is yeah, significantly far from, from the targets we have. But as I said, equally important, we have this target on ICT specialists. And why we have this target? Not only because we like to set, to set targets, but really because we believe that in, in Europe, in today's labor market, we need more ICT specialists. And this is something we see. We see that companies, when they're trying to recruit ICT specialists, actually they have difficulties. They don't find enough of them. And we know that we need more of them also, and I will, I will have the opportunity to come back to this later on. Also because we are now facing, uh, we are now competing globally with, with some, some other uh, global partners or competitors, and, and we need to actually build ourselves, and we need to have more ICT specialists. So in some countries, it's, we are approaching these targets, whereas in some other, we are very far from this target, and we need to, to work collectively to really achieve this target. Third target we have is the one on gender convergence, which is very important as well. We are speaking about inclusive labor market. So what we want, we want to have gender convergence. We want to have as women as men in, in ICT specialist position. And for this, we need to, to, to really break barriers. We need to break stereotypes. We need to, to, to work with, with NGOs. We need to work with everyone to actually push women to, to, um, to take this, uh, these careers. So yeah, as I was saying, we have this very strong political leadership uh, and, 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 and they really believe that digital skills is one of the key priority. So this is um, Ursula von der Leyen from her State of Union speech. And actually, she said, we will invest in 5G, in fiber. But equally important is investment in digital skills. And, and this is something that was said also in the, in the previous panel, is that we are trying to invest in these key technologies. But the thing is, if we are investing in these technologies, but if we don't have the people to work with these technologies, to design these technologies, and just to be able to actually build what we call the European sovereignty, we will not go anywhere. So really, it's exceptionally important to, to also invest in, in people, in human capital, and this is what we are trying to do at, um, at EU level. So how we are trying to do this, these are the different funding instruments, and, and I will not go in details into, into all of them, but just maybe the, the two main ones, and I will have the, the opportunity to, to talk a bit more later on these two. So we have the recovery and resilience facility you may be familiar with. This is this huge uh, funding instrument to, to help actually European member states to, to, to come back from, from the crisis and, and to actually build uh, their strengths. We have the Digital Europe program, which is one of the key funding in instruments for, for digital, but we also have some, some other programs. So we have uh, the, the structural funds, we have the ERDF, we have the ESF, we have Horizons, uh, we have Erasmus Plus as well. So really, we have all these uh, funding instruments uh, that are actually trying to, to tackle the, the challenge that I was mentioning earlier. Um, but I will, I will try to, to just give you 
a bit of a focus on, on two very important instruments, so the, the, the recovery and resilience facility, because this is really something significant, and, and this is this is something new, this is something we have been working hard with member states to actually design the recovery plan. So how it works a bit, we have set this target of 20% in every national plan. What it means is that member states, they presented their, their uh, recovery plans to the commission and they had to devote at least 20% of their investment to digital. And what, and what we see actually now we have some, we have I think 24 or 25 adopted recovery plans. And what we see actually is that member states, they went beyond this 20% threshold and, and they, they devoted around 26% for digital. And when I say digital, this is, not, this is not only investment in capacity, but this is also investment in people. And, and this, is, this is very important for us. So what we see roughly is around 25 billion uh, euros for investment in digital skills. So this is all kind of digital skills. This is very basic digital skills. This is tablets for schools. This is uh, trainings for, for workers. This is new programs in university, etc. So this is, this is really significant. This is all across the EU. And, and more than numbers, I would just like to give you two very concrete examples because I think this this really explains well what we are trying to do with member states with this, which is this example of Spain. So Spain, for example, they devoted 4.7 billion euros for, for digital skills within their recovery plan. And just one example, they have this very massive action, actually, which is called the Digital Toolkit for SME. Uh, and they will help SME in, in their digitalization journey, and they will actually help uh, SME's employees also to participate in training for digital, and in total, it's 3 billion euros that will be financed uh, by the EU. In Belgium, so, so closer to us, what they will do, for example, they will build a new, a, a new training center in Charleroi. I don't know if you're familiar with Charleroi, but it, it is in one of the, of the poorest uh, regions in Belgium, and they will build from scratch this new training center, and this training center will actually provide uh, employees, but also job seekers with, with training opportunities, etc. Uh, digital Euro program, so this is, this is a bit different, this is not exactly the same functioning, etc., but this is also very important. This is a direct uh, program that we are managing directly in the Commission, in DigiConnect, and with this program, with the Digital Euro program, what we are trying to do is really to have the best uh, ICT specialist. Here we are speaking about the, the most advanced digital skills. We, are, we want to have in Europe people being able to use this very advanced technology. We want to have the best experts in artificial intelligence, in cyber security, in quantum computing, etc. We know that in Europe we don't have enough of them. We know also that in Europe we don't have enough training opportunities for them. We don't have enough master, we don't have enough uh, short-term training. And, and really when, when we compare the situation to to, to the US or to, uh, or to China or even to the UK, we see that Europe is really lagging behind. So what we need to do is that we need to really invest collectively. We need to provide uh, the labor force with upskilling opportunities, but we also need to train all these new young people. Uh, we, we need to give them the opportunity to really enroll in, in the best universities, and, and we need to push universities to partners with, uh, with uh, academics, with uh, research centers, but also with businesses, because really I believe that this is a key challenge that everyone really needs to, to work together to design this program. So we are making sure that these programs are actually very relevant for the skills that are needed today in, in the labor market. And I think I'm already running late. So one last point, which is, which is also very important for us, and again, this is the idea of working all together. So I presented the initiatives that, that we are fostering at EU level, but what we are doing also is that we are working in networks, and, and because us in Brussels, we can't, we can't reach everyone in all the territories, in all the regions. So what we are trying to do is really to, to bring everyone together, to organize workshops, to organize activities, to try to showcase best practices. We believe that something which is working well in Lithuania should be working well also in Spain, and something which is working in France should be working in Germany, etc. So we are trying really to have this network of stakeholders so they can speak together, they can present what they are doing, and, and they can take inspiration from each other. And I think I am done. It's 10 minutes, sorry. But uh, I, will be, I will be very happy to, to take any questions uh, after, uh, after the, the different presentations. Thank you very much.
you very much, Arthur, for your powerful presentation. And uh, our next speaker is Mr. Frank Zeeburn Thomas. He's the head of unit for fair, green, and digital transitions. This is a research unit at DG Employment of the European Commission. His presentation today will focus on active labor market policies and fair transition policies that DG Employment has been introducing to support digital and technological transformation in the EU. So please, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind invitation, for the kind introduction, and for having me in this very, on this very nice day in this very nice place <laughs> to deliver that presentation from, from the side of DG Employment. Yes. Thank you very much. I use this. So um, with uh, thanks again, let me start by pointing out um, the obvious to you, um, that the ecological, technological, industrial, and demographic transformations will drive not only one, but f multiple futures of work. And the one we will end up with, from our point of view, will largely depend on the policy responses that we formulate in response to those challenges. Um, the unit which we have set up in the context of a reorganization only last year on fair, green, and digital transitions and research um, is tasked with exactly that, supporting fair transitions towards a climate-neutral, digital, and sustainable Europe with a particular focus on the employment and social policies that can support this. We do so through a, so a policy analysis, advice, and by developing analytical tools and research actions that help design, implement, and monitor just transition policies, initiatives, and instruments. We're also ensuring DG Ample's new role as research DG under Horizon Europe and notably uh, our role as a co-chair of Cluster 2 on Culture, Creativity, and Inclusive Society, where we try to aim at strengthening SSH integration in general and mainstream employment skills, social and behavioral aspects throughout the program. We don't do this alone, obviously. We do this with many partners in our DG. They are dedicated units dealing with future of work, with skills, with vocational education training, and we work a lot also with agencies such as CEDEF or Bureau Fund and the European Training Foundation. The work that we do is indicative, we believe, of the Commission's approach generally towards formulating responses to current and future labour market trends. We aim to understand the process of change related to both the digital and the green transition transformation, the challenges they pose, um, and also develop policies, as I said, appropriate policy responses that help us to ensure that this transition, these transformations are fair and inclusive. So when looking at um, technological disruptions and digitalization to start with, there are obviously a number of important um, impacts on the labor market, um, well known to most of you, I assume, and also uh, shown in some of our earlier um, analysis, including notably in an Employment Social Development Report of the year 2018, which was dedi uh, dedicated to that topic. I'm mentioning it because uh, the 22 edition of that report comes out today and also has an interesting thematic focus on labor market policies. So first, robots are becoming ever cheaper when compared with human labor. In the US, the real price of robots has halved since 1990, while that of labor has nearly doubled. Second, robotization has linked to some job losses, which mainly occurred in manufacturing, where according to available data, 85% of the operational stock of industrial robots is currently used. The net effect, however, of these new technologies and automation job creation is still under debate and will be decided um, by the speed of uptake of technologies and the pace at which displaced workers can be retrained and migrate towards higher skilled jobs in other parts of the economy, including in the green econ economy, but also obviously on the complementaries between robotization, automation, and human labor. This has important implications for public policy. It's important to note, however, that digitalization is also creating jobs, and it's obviously one of the main drivers of competitiveness and job creation overall. For example, digitalization has created over 2 million jobs in the European IT sector in the last two decades. And the third and last point which I would like to stress is related to job polarization. Evidence suggests that the proportion of workers in middle income and middle skilled, middle paid jobs is shrinking in most member states and most labor markets. The increased uptake of AI and robotization is also expected to drive such polarization further in the future. These impacts on the labor market need to be mediated to ensure a fair and inclusive digital transition. The importance of training hereby is paramount, obviously. First, to ensure that workers are able to work in complementarity with machines and digital technologies. Second, to ensure that those workers who are displaced find new jobs, 
in the greening part of the economy, but also in other sectors of the economy which are growing. And our unit is, as I said, working to understand the interaction furthermore between the digital transformation and the green transition with an eye for possible mitigating effects. So according to our evidence, for example, the job creation due to the green transition and climate change policies uh, can mitigate labor market polarization by creating new jobs, mainly in the middle income, middle skilled uh, segment of the labor market, in the construction sector, in the circular economy, and in many others affected. In the analysis, and I want like to say this, uh, our, one of our first deliverables as a unit is a, a council recommendation on ensuring a fair transition towards climate neutrality, which was adopted unanimously by the employment social ministers a few weeks ago, and which is a response to the so-called Fit for 55 package back in July 21, presented then, and the open question as to what are the employment and social impacts of this, on the many legislative proposals presented there. At that time, the Commission was tasked to come up with a proposal for such a council recommendation to guide member states to address labour and social impacts of the green transition. We believe, and our analysis shows, and there's an accompanying analytical paper accompanying the proposal which was published in December last year, that with the right policies in place, the green transition can in aggregate create up to 1 million jobs net by 2030 and the multiple by 2050. As I said, these jobs are likely to be in the middle income, middle skill range of the labour market. Such projections, however, do depend on a number of implicit assumptions, including the absence of labor and skill shortages, smooth labor market transitions, full implementation of policy agendas, and many more, which are obviously important to take into account. We know that some industries face job losses with disproportionate impact on certain regions, notably in fossil fuel extraction, fossil fuel-based electricity generation. Other sectors will need to transform substantially, transport, obviously, and other energy-intensive uh, industries um, which have transport sector in particular, which has to reduce emissions from greenhouse gases by 90% by 2050. And the automotive value chain obviously is a case in point subject to heavy structural transformation and restructuring um, to reach those targets. The Council recommendation, which I show here, which is a um, general recommendation covering policy packages for a just transition across several policy areas, but also a better evidence, a whole of economy, a whole of society approach and funding opportunities, which we may want to discuss later, has a particular focus highlighted in red here, obviously, on education, training and lifelong learning, on which I will say a word uh, in a second, um, uh, and which are key for implementing a fair transition. I will use the remaining time, if I have any, to say a word about the support we provide on skills formation at the European level. Um, the COMPASS here is obviously the European Pillar of Social Rights, which are all known, which will celebrate soon its fifth anniversary, and which comprises 20 principles and uh, rights um, in the area of social and employment policy. One of the headline targets of the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan, endorsed at the Porto Social Summit in May last year, is to reach 60% of adults to participate in training each year by 2030, up from some 37% this year. As part of the implementation of the Action Plan, the Commission also has published a number of other initiatives which were recently adopted, including proposals for council recommendations on micro-credentials and on individual learning accounts, which would help facilitate skills development and transferability. And uh, other proposals are underway, including on education for sustainability and working conditions and platform economy, on which we may want to discuss. The European Skills Agenda and the Digital Education Plan, which was already mentioned, were put in place by member states to help achieving those targets and address challenges related to the green and digital transition. The Pact for Skills, which is a flagship action under the European Skills Agenda, provides the entry point for all of our skills-related commitments, and it does help provide support to upskilling and reskilling of people in general, with a strong focus on industrial ecosystems and regions most affected by the COVID pandemic and also by the um, impacts of the digital and green transition. It covers all skill types relevant for all sectors, including soft skills. It promotes apprenticeships in the European Union, which will continue to be further developed under the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. And it uh, relates to digital skills, which was mentioned already before, under the Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition. Uh, 
The Commission supports signatories of such pacts for skills through a number of tools, a networking hub to find partners and link with existing tools, a knowledge hub uh, sharing webinars, seminars, peer learning activities and updates on EU policies and instruments, and a guidance and resources hub which guides uh, interested partners to access all relevant information on funding, financial, financial possibilities uh, and uh, access to pact members and national and regional authorities. In this context, let me also mention that the recently adopted Repower EU plan, which is Europe's reply to Russia's war in Ukraine, to help uh, accelerate the transition and ensure, reach energy independence or energy security, ensure energy security and reach independence from Russian fossil fuels by 2027, um, that was the proposal highlights the particular role that reskilling and upskilling have in this context and proposes also to set up a new large-scale skills partnership for onshore renewable energies and solar uh, energy in particular, uh, which we are supporting. Already 11 such skilled partnerships, partnerships exist in many other sectors, uh, ranging from automotive, microelectronics, uh, offshore renewable energy, construction, also to, but also to sectors such as proximity and social economy. And I should say one word on the, under the uh, industrial policy, there are so-called transition pathways which stakeholders set up bottom-up to define also um, skill needs, future skill needs and realistic tra feasible transition pathways for the sector. Coming to an end, um, I will not go into much detail into this slide, but as one of the actions under the skills agenda, um, uh, obviously we take note that there's also a need to improve the definition of taxonomy of skills for the green transition. Uh, this has been done in the European Classification of Occupation Skills and Competences, so-called ESCO, where a total of or more than 570 skills and knowledge con concepts have been labelled as green, and in addition, I think my JRC colleague can say more a bit about this uh, competence framework on sustainability has been developed in this context. This is important also for the use, for example, of public employment services to help uh, support such transitions. Um, and I already mentioned that longer term education is obviously a key issue. My last slide, I will not go into this in detail as Arthur already presented this to a large extent, that there are many funding tools obviously in with, into which to tap. Horizon Europe is one, including uh, its focus on human-centered uh, technological developments um, under Horizon Europe. The Recovery and Resilience Facility was mentioned just to say that, that here too the Repower EU plan suggests to add more than 200, 210 billion euros in, in addition to promote and accelerate the green transition. And this money, according to the guidance and the proposal, proposed amendment made, should be used for a number of initiatives, including reskilling and upskilling of the workforce to speed up this transition. You are all faced with this, and you hear that also in, in relation to the green transition, there are skill and labor shortages. And last but not least, the European Social Fund, obviously, which has a general focus on education and skills. So to cl conclude, I would just um, to say that to put the spotlight on research and innovation actions and highlight their role in driving inclusive labor markets in the transition. While we do understand many of the social and economic implications of technological transformations, we believe more research is needed to investigate the labor and the distributional effects uh, of these transitions and of the twinning between the digital and green transition in particular to allow us to better prioritize our policies, but also to involve stakeholders, take them along and engage with them in an open, transparent dialogue on the actual impact of this transition. And I look forward to working with you on this and to your questions and reactions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for this rich presentation. Indeed, we are so much li limited by time, but it would be great to look further into each of these uh, different uh, initiatives launched by the European Commission. Our next speaker is Martin Humburg. Martin is a sector economist in the Education and Public Research Division at the European Investment Bank. In addition, Martin is also a member of the Pillars Expert Group on Future Technology, Skills and Labour Markets. Today, Martin will provide insights into investments currently made and also those which are planned across Europe to prepare the education system to technological transformation. Please welcome Martin on stage. So thank you very much. I actually spent uh, four years in my previous life in Brussels, but I've never discovered this uh, oasis. I'm very 
very glad that I was able to discover it, and it's really amazing that such places exist. Um, I was asked by the, the organizers to, to um, present my, actually my experiences from, from my job, which is actually the appraisal of investment projects in the education public research sector uh, all across Europe. And uh, as a comment, uh, so, um, so my, 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 what I'm going to tell you is not based on some representative sample or, or some, some, some uh, systematic dat data analysis, but really on the, on the projects, I'm, uh, on my experiences on, on the field. Um, also, uh, my view on, uh, because of the nature of the work, my view on investment is limited to uh, uh, investment in infrastructure, although we know, not least uh, from research by Eric Hanushek and colleagues, that the quality of teachers is, of course, the, the most important ingredient uh, uh, in education. Uh, so without trying to diminish the value of my work, uh, um, uh, my, my view will be uh, limited to, to uh, infrastructure investments. So indeed, so the first question I, was, uh, I, I would like to reflect upon is, um, are education providers uh, and training providers aware of this trend of automa automation and, and do they invest in accordingly? And there I think we can differentiate between uh, higher education and public research, where there's really visible investments in uh, research infrastructure on artificial intelligence, manufacturing 4.0, um, and the reason um, is probably because they see it as, a, as an opportunity for higher education and research. It's an opportunity. It's, a, it's an area for development and growth. Um, and also, researchers tend to go where the, where the funding is, and, and there is uh, uh, some, some funding opportunities in this area. But also because higher education in institutions um, are quite uh, autonomous, so they can make these investment decisions quite quickly and respond to these, to these trends uh, uh, quite quickly. Uh, general education, um, my impression is that uh, there the, the concern with automation is really limited to the provision of digital skills and investments in some uh, basic infrastructure like Wi-Fi, uh, whiteboards, uh, some tablets here and there. Um, um, and uh, probably, hopefully, uh, accompanied by, by some uh, teacher training in, with these skills. And vocational education and training, if the evidence we have plays out or the projections we have plays out, uh, one would expect um, in vocational education training to, to, um, to, to be where actually the, the action will happen. So some professions will uh, appear, some uh, will disappear, some will evolve, uh, the, the skills composition will, will change. So this is actually where the action should happen. Um, however, in contrast to higher education, uh, vocational education and training is, is uh, mostly uh, managed and, and, and uh, steered at some central level. So there the awareness really uh, depends on whether the, 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 the central level, wherever, if this is regional or national, the curriculum development, etc., uh, is, is catching up with these trends and whether there is a, um, um, a good relationship or a good um, structural communication with, uh, with employers to be aware of these trends and what's happening in, in the labor market. Here, just a few examples of some projects I've been appraising in the past. So, for example, in higher education, the Tyndall National Institute of the University of um, University College Cork in Ireland, they're expanding their capacities uh, to, to provide more space for research and also update their equipment. So there you really see that um, there's a lot of demand for this kind of research. It's also in the, in the Irish national strategy that uh, Tyndall should be uh, developed. Um, <clears throat> you also have um, the Technical University of Cluj in Romania, which builds or is planning to build um, uh, um, uh, a new building 
uh, in infrastructure uh, which will host the, the research center for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, there's other examples. Um, so these investments are happening. Uh, they, universities are trying to take advantage of this trend, but of course they also face constraints. The labor market of uh, researchers is international, so actually these two uh, will probably uh, compete for the same scarce uh, experts in this field. Um, in, in schools, in vets, you really, nobody's building a, a vet center or a school just to address the, the impact of automation on the labor market. Uh, they have multiple objectives, of course, we all know that, but you see some uh, purchase of specific equipment together with employers, so, so to follow the trends on the labor market, this is, this, for example, is a uh, it's a nice machine that cuts some wood for the construction sector, so they don't have to do it manually anymore. They, they inform themselves which, which machine the employers in the regions um, are using, so they try to find a compromise and actually put this, uh, this machine uh, as an educational tool in their, in their new uh, facilities. Uh, in preparation of this, um, um, of my presentation, I was asked, um, uh, so do you see any patterns across, across regions? Are some countries or regions investing more or less? And uh, with the, 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 the very few data points I have uh, as an experience, I, I could not say much. Uh, but um, I found some, uh, some statements in the EIB investment report from 2019. And uh, hopefully this matches with uh, the, the research we, we heard uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, I wasn't here, but I hope it, uh, it's not uh, contrary. Uh, so it seems to be the, the regions that are structurally different, uh, difficult at this moment that uh, are at the highest risk of, of, um, uh, of actually uh, being affected by this automation change and uh, loss, loss of jobs. Um, and... So these regions should actually be investing more, but what you, what you see, and there's another figure from the um, EIB municipality survey in 2020, so which municipalities are investing or preparing themselves for the digital and green uh, transitions, and uh, unfortunately, it's again the, the non-cohesion um, uh, municipalities uh, that are investing most and uh, those in the less developed or transition regions um, uh, invest the least. So when we speak about um, inclusiveness, it's not only some parts of the population uh, against or and other parts of the population, but it's really, it, it has a regional dimension and um, it is a threat to cohesion if, if this process is not uh, well managed. Um, so what is needed, in my opinion, is, of course, uh, data is the, the starting point, so we should produce knowledge and observe the trends, what is really happening and how should we react. Then, of course, this data needs to be uh, interpreted and incorporated in the planning processes for investments at the, at the central, regional, local levels. So one needs to build uh, planning capacity, and I think... The, the work package you're leading with the policy uh, maker tool is, uh, is, is one uh, of the contributions towards achieving this. Um, we need to ensure that, uh, so every transition is of course uh, costly, so there, there's financial resources necessary. We've seen from my colleagues that uh, there is uh, quite some money out there to be spent. In addition, also the, the EIB provides uh, um, loans to also to, to blend and to co-finance uh, investments from other funds. And um, I cannot emphasize enough that uh, the investments we do in infrastructure should, of course, be accompanied by uh, investments in, in teacher training. And um, also from my side, I, uh, sometimes I have the opportunity to also provide advice. Thank you very much.
Thank you, thank you, Martin. And our last speaker of this panel is Matteo Sostero. Matteo is a researcher at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, where he leads the project on skills intelligent. As a member of the employment team in the Human Capital and Employment Unit, Matteo conducts research related to the future of work. His today's presentation focuses on the analysis of online job advertisements and automation of labor in the EU. Matteo, the floor is yours. So thank you, Tatiana, and thank you all for inviting me. Um, it's indeed quite a privilege to be here. And um, uh, I'd just like to, to mention that I'm not necessarily, actually I'm not, as will become increasingly clear, not presenting the institutional view of the JRC or indeed the Commission, because my distinguished colleagues can do that much better than me. But I was taking this opportunity, this privilege to be here to try to reconcile different views that we've heard in the sessions uh, yesterday, in general, in the academic discourse, in industry, with those of policy. And in particular, uh, when it comes to labor, I think that there's uh, quite a lot of back and forth of ideas between academia, industry, and policy. And these ideas, you know, sometimes they take a life of their own. And uh, a couple of examples I would submit, and again, personal opinions, eh, but it's some, I believe that some of it is, it is backed by research, is that when it comes to uh, automation in particular, and uh, polarization as well, the impact and the extent of it has been quite overstated. So uh, to, as a corrective, so, so to speak, to what we believe is, um, uh, uh, well, uh, trend in, in, in the discourse, I would like to say that, for instance, like the impact of new technology, computers and robots AI to displace workers, we, we see that as part of a narrative that usually says that also the income structure is polarizing, meaning there's a hollowing out of the middle class, uh, uh, a rise in low paid and high paid jobs at the same time. And it is said the solution to this is to, for workers and government to, uh, that need to adapt and to invest in skills, among other things. This is an overly simplified, a bit caricatured, provocative uh, uh, representation of the debate. But you know, to simplify, let's go with that. The evidence for that. I would argue is fairly mixed uh, slash contradictory. So there's actually fairly little empirical evidence of technology and uh, displacement of workers on a large scale so far. So of course, we're always told, you know, there's the technology of the future, it's, there's one day it's robots, the next day it's artificial intelligence, it's always around the corner, the goalposts have been shifted a few times about what it looked like, etc. But believe us, it's coming, this time is different and so on. And yet, and yet, uh, the debate has been continued for decades, and it keeps repeating itself. So in particular, artificial intelligence, as of today, has been a bit less successful than maybe was advertised five, ten years ago in terms of its capabilities and its potential to actually op operationally replace human labor. Where are the self-driving cars? Uh, and in part because we tend to we, and technologists in particular, tend to underestimate the extent to which other people's jobs are complex. And many of the jobs that were, of the occupations and the, the sectors that were at high risk of automations, you know, on, in the long run, if you zoom out, they're actually doing quite well. Maybe they're not growing as much in employment volume as the rest, but employment growth there is. And, you know, there were claims of large-scale displacement that's certainly not the, the direction of the, of the evidence. And we can probably discuss about that. Reasonable people can disagree. And, and there, and there the, the evidence is a bit more clear cut, is that income polarization is mostly not happening in the EU. In fact, what we see is a pattern of upgrading, so uh, moving from low paid to mid paid and mid paid to high paid. And to the extent, and there's also a strand of you know, revisionist empirical evidence according to which it never actually happened in the US as well, or certainly not because of uh, automation, and it had more to do with trade. Now. Uh, why I'm telling you this? Because all of this has been uh, used to, uh, has informed the debate concerning skills. And, I, and even if we disagree with some of the premises, we can agree on, some, on, on the development, but what I'm trying to say is reframe the terms of the debate, so to speak. The first is that skills as a concept, as we've discussed yesterday as well, you know, it's a versatile but also a bit slippery concept. Uh, and there's many different uh, academic definitions, you know, is it about tasks, is it about education, is it about uh, occupational hierarchies and so on. 
Uh, but they're all focused on the individual. And the current, current nomenclature that I see more and more is talking about talent, individual talent, the race for talent, the need for talent. And the focus uh, in, in industry, but also in policy, has been in standardizing and codifying these skills. And through instruments like skill taxonomies, uh, whether developed by the pri private or public sector, or, or indeed the commission, competence frameworks, and uh, our, our uh, uh, unit at the GRC has worked on that. Uh, well, this is usually a prelude, in a way, to create a market for skills as tradable commodities. So, uh, and again, the focus is on individual level solutions. So, individual skill profiles, individual learning accounts, courses to, com to complete skill gaps, uh, uh, micro-credentials, and so on. And also, you know, an emphasis on the skill gaps and skill shortages, meaning what training workers need to do in order to adapt to the need of firms, or uh, less often what firms themselves need to provide. So this is not to dispute that skills are important. They are absolutely important, and I think we can all agree on that. Uh, uh, but maybe I would submit that we need a ch slight change in emphasis. The first is... Uh, that there's a risk in reifying skills, in making skills a thing, a commodity, uh, as, as we seem to be doing. It, it may actually also uh, end up reinforcing existing labor market inequality, in particular the distinction between uh, professional versus elementary occupations. So uh, during the pandemic, we had this observation that you know, there was a, quite a substantial overlap between the occupations that we describe as low skills and those that we describe as essential jobs. So we, which, which is it? And the, these narratives, they have an impact in terms of uh, the, the, the prospects that, and, the, and, and the station of the uh, workers themselves. And also, conceptualizing the skill gaps, is it an individual level problem? Is it a matter of that person taking one additional course and having one more credential in order to get the job? Or is it a matter of uh, capabilities at the national company level, or, or indeed European? And also, um, we, we, I think we should be a, a bit skeptical in, all, in taking the, the, empl the employer perspective, meaning uh, when employers complain about shortages of skills, in some cases it's legitimate, there are indeed acute uh, shortages in the digital sector, for instance, but in other cases, you know, maybe it's also a case of low wages or maybe the companies themselves did not provide a lot of uh, in-house training. Uh, so we should balance, balance this different perspective. And finally, uh, I would say, um, uh, th there's an issue of industrial st uh, structure. Yes, skills are, are important, but which companies require more skills and more advanced skills? Large ones. And the uh, policy at the national and EU level has been, you know, towards SMEs and maybe not encouraging them always to, to grow and to specialize, which would actually increase the demand for skill. Uh, so finally, uh, what, what do we need? We need actually more data, you know, so we're researchers and uh, we're obviously going to need more data, but I argue that we, we do. We do need better data on occupational tasks and skills, representative surveys that allow us to describe the spectrum of skills from the manual to the more complex with an uh, even-handed level of detail. And we, uh, we should continue to elevate, as we do and as the Commission has been doing, the dignity of work per se, and there's initiatives concerning platform work that we can discuss, uh, and also part-time work, uh, social inclusion, uh, lots of wonderful th uh, work on this. And also uh, an industrial strategy, uh, as we've been discussing, that goes be in particular towards uh, uh, the industrial structure of growing beyond small and medium enterprises, for the reasons I said. In and in general, uh, as we were saying yesterday, uh, there's a scope for directed technical in uh, innovation, in particular, when it comes to the green transition, kick-starting it, and green skills, it requires the public sector, the commission in this case, to set standards as, as we've been doing in order to define what those are and to ensure that there is a sufficient supply. But also to encourage labor augmenting, labor augmenting technology. As we were observing earlier, late yesterday, how come there are thousands of pat patents about technology which claims to be displacing workers, whether or not that's the case, it's another matter, and not so many in terms of augmenting labor productivity, making work more bearable, more dignified, more productive. And finally, and I think this is really important, in general is investment in basic research for, uh, for, to invest in the technologies of the future 
especially considering that, for instance, artificial intelligence tends to be uh, developed mostly by a few large companies and the rest are users, as we, as we discussed yesterday. So I hope this, is, uh, this was a satisfactory and hopefully not too controversial take on the subject. And uh, thank you all for the, for the opportunity to discuss. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matteo, and it was great also to hear all of your different perspectives on the priorities already, because you already put some, some nice suggestions. Now we'll move to the panel session. I know we are a bit short on time, so I'm afraid that we have to steal a few minutes from the second panel. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but okay, let's start. Okay, so uh, I would like to start our discussion with this broad topic of inclusive labor market policies because at the moment we are conducting some uh, uh, case studies across regions. We are also looking at different so-called inclusive labor market policies across the EU and we see that uh, how they are defined and what constitutes these inclusive labor market policies in the EU across countries, across regions, of course, differs. And that's why I would like to get your perspective on what constitutes inclusive labor market policies in the EU. Do you see some commonalities and approaches? Okay. I didn't know that this question was for me, but okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try my best to answer on what exactly inclusive policies can be at EU level. And I think this is, this is a very crucial question because this is exactly what us, we are trying to do. I mean, we have this, this, this focus on, on digital skills because we believe that today, if you, if you want to participate and anyway, you will have to participate in the labor market, you will have to have some, some kind of digital skills. And, and to start with, I think it's really important to, to really give the opportunity to everyone to have these very basic digital skills. And, and I would like to come back to something which was said earlier in another uh, discussion on the elderies. Um, today, we also have some, some older people in the labor market and we need to give them the opportunity to, to upskill. So, so really what I see is two things. Uh, the first one is really to, to giving to every, everyone basically the opportunity to upskill and to reskill. Uh, to the current workforce, and really, this is this is really a huge challenge, and this is also something Frank said uh, earlier in in his presentation that we have this target of having 60% of the Europeans to participate in in training every year. And I think if we want to really build this inclusive European labour market, we really need to strengthen this, and and really to to really give the opportunity to everyone to participate in this kind of training. This kind of training could be on digital skills, it could be indeed on green skills and on all, all other kind of talent. Um, but I think this is, this, is, uh, this is really key. The second thing is really also to, to, to give the opportunity to the young people, so those that are still in high school, the opportunity to also enroll in, in, in very good program. And for the moment, we are missing this, this program. So the thing is, if we want to have an inclusive labor market, we also need to have an inclusive uh, labor market for the best experts. Um, and this is something we are trying to, to work on. Uh, this is a huge challenge that, that we are currently facing in Europe. But uh, yes, this is what we are trying to do. Anybody else would like to maybe reflect on this? Um, thanks a lot. I'll <clears throat> try to be short. I think the, the frameworks are in place. I mentioned a particular European pillar of social rights. There's a common understanding. It was uh, endorsed by, by all EU institutions, by all member states, by social partners. So I think we, we, we do have our compass. We do have our framework. Uh, we also have a joint understanding of what's needed, I guess, to ensure... Uh, I focused a lot on the fair transition, what kind of policies, that inclusiveness, inclusion is a goal on its own, obviously, but it's also um, something which is key to, to uh, enabling such transitions, to, to keeping our societies together, to, uh, and to, to ensure social acceptance, public acceptance for this transition on which we embark. Obviously, policies are not always at the EU level and central level, they are at um, uh, national and other levels, and uh, they differ across member states. But if you ask me what are, what are priorities in this, there are many, and we try to do many things, as I said, including a recently 
uh, not yet adopted, but a, a political agreement was reached on a on, um, proposal by the Commission, which we think is historic, namely a directive for adequate minimum wages, which should promote also upward convergence and address some of the regional dimensions. But to, 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 to drop uh, three, four ideas, what's needed for uh, to, to make this inclusion happen, uh, maybe again with a focus on the transition, we need to find out what are innovative job-to-job -job transitions, how to help people to transit uh, through in these transitions while having some safeguards. Skills are important, but skills are not all. Um, so we need also to, uh, to, uh, to ensure that these transitions are sort of supported, uh, including through income support. Uh, I fully agree with uh, uh, Arthur that this has to integrate all parts of society in the labor market, also those at the margin currently. So uh, uh, gender or f uh, female employment rates, which are lower in some of those sectors, uh, were mentioned. But also the needs, for example, people without uh, uh, official formal credentials today. Uh, these are people who are very much willing and uh, um, want to contribute to fighting climate change. So I think we have to come up also with solutions to integrate them and to make them part of this transition. Access to essential services is important. Energy is the key one currently in the limelight, but also transport, many others, education, digital communications. Why? Because it's your access to training, to employment in the first place and to social participation overall. Um, social protection, I mentioned already. The Commission this year will also come up with a proposal on minimum income, a recommendation on minimum income. As I said, some kind of protection throughout the transition is key to, to keep people on board and not leave them behind. And last but not least, working conditions were mentioned. Um, there's a lot of scope. We have seen all how, how important digitalization, digital tools were in the, in the pandemic. They have, <laughs> they have maintained our economic and social lives to a large extent. And have, but we're also increasingly aware of what, what may be excesses or what may be negative impacts on which we need to work and therefore the attention on working conditions for the platform economy, algorithmic management or others. So I think all of this, it's a big project, but I think we, we agree on what the areas are and we have to come up with good ideas for those. Thank you very much. My next question is about challenges. What would you say are the key challenges of the policymakers uh, in the EU to ensure preparedness of the labor market to the future of work? And how can these challenges be tackled? Martin, perhaps you would like to respond? Yes, um, <clears throat> for me, one of the key challenges is really the um, uh, possible or potential uh, regional disparities. So what some, some um, regions falling behind or even further behind that there are now already. Um, so cohesion uh, was, a, was a founding principle, I think, of the, of the European Union or the European community. And it was also uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why the European Investment Bank was established. And I think there's a risk to move on to other topics like uh, uh, the green and digital transition without realizing that uh, uh, these are actually intertwined, and that um, I, w I was th I was thinking it's probably very easy to build a small uh, data model to predict the the the, the status of a region uh, less developed transition non cohesion um, just by the the number of charging points for for electric vehicles. Yeah, so these things are absolutely related, um, and uh, uh, so cohesion must stay one of the important uh, pillars of the EU. Thank you. Matteo? Yes, uh, so I, I very much agree with, uh, with the point on, on cohesion, convergence and infrastructure. Uh, relating to skills specifically, as I said, I, I do think it's important and as we, we, we need to keep our focus both on pushing the boundaries, on ensuring that we have enough specialized profiles, as we're doing, and also, uh, as, as Arthur was putting it, to raise the level of basic digital skills. It doesn't just uh, apply to digital, it applies to schooling in general. There's still uh, large dropout rates, and uh, the level of competence sometimes is not as, as high as, as we want, and as Professor Hanushek explained yesterday, it's, it is perhaps the largest determinant. But uh, as, as we do that, we also need to, to ensure that these skills are put to good use in companies, right? So that uh, in an ideal world, we're all very slightly underskilled in the job that we're currently doing. I certainly am. And, uh, very and, critical of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but what matters, we, we don't want to uh, also to have an oversupply of, uh, of, of skilled personnel in their, uh, in their current position. And in order to, to have that, companies need to 
to grow, to specialize, to, to make good use of the, of the skills and capabilities that are developed. Thank you. And my last question before we also open the opportunity to our audience to, uh, to ask a few questions to you is about the priorities. In your view, what should be the priorities, intervention areas of the policymakers uh, that should facilitate the path towards an inclusive labor market? And should there be a greater focus on job creation, job transformation, job displacement effect? Well, again, the thing is, I'm really working every day on digital skills and on training. So this will be hard to say something else that what we really need is to have more skilled people. And, and, and I think this is, this is really clear, not only because I'm working on it, but because I truly believe that today we, we don't have enough skilled people in Europe. And, and this trend is actually going worse and worse. And, and that really we, I really believe that we need, we need to work collectively. Uh, and and this should be really our priority because and and this is also something something we said that we are today in a global competition with other partners. Uh, if we want to ensure growth, if we want to ensure uh, job creation in Europe, we need to, to to make sure that actually we have we have the best people in Europe and we have a talented workforce. Um, so this is definitely a huge challenge. Um, this will not be solved. Uh, tomorrow, nor even in, in, in the years to come, but, but really I believe that we have, we have the capacity, we have the capabilities together in Europe to, to, to really work together and, and to achieve, to achieve this, um, this target and, 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 and to really together build this, uh, this strong uh, future. Thank you. So collaboration and also investment in human capital. Any more additions? Maybe one word in the in the current context. Let's say where we really um, see um, value chains, supply chains, and so on, so on at risk, and where we may are maybe facing, let's say, uh, critical issues. We have to address. I think uh, I would like to add to what I said already before. Um, something like credibility and confidence uh, in these transitions, in the in the feasibility of these programs. So inclu uh, inclusion is one of the, the key elements of it. And what I mentioned before, a human-centered focus of research here in the research community. So technological innovations are key. They, they will not uh, um, achieve, uh, manage, succeed a, a green transition, a transition towards sustainability without those. But we at the same time have to ask us the question, what are these technologies people need? What are those which respond to their needs, which are accessible to all, and which have this inclusiveness dimension? Um, inbuilt, um, which also respond to, to demands, which also support um, new ways of uh, lo localization of production in certain cases, promotion of a new kind of circular economy and others. So I think they will really uh, look to research to come up with these ideas. And I did mention before, it's always a general point, stakeholder involvement in the open dialogue. We feel it's key. We, we, and I, I did mention the recommendation we have. It's a, it's a soft policy tool. It's one where we, by member states, take a certain commitment to assess challenges and, uh, um, um, let's say, have policy packages in place which address those. Um, all of this is based on long-term projections of a lot of research we can do and based on assumptions. But when we went to speak to stakeholders, when we had hearings preparing before, they all said, yes, we are with you, we, we hear that, we are willing, we, we see the problem, we want to contribute. More than 90% of Europeans say they want to do that. They, they, they see a personal responsibility. More than 50% of young people asked in service say we want to have a future career addressing, helping to fight one way or another climate change. But then they say, but please stop giving us these long-term projections. Tell us what the actual impacts are on the ground. Show us actual benefits and costs. And uh, it's always the data issue. It's also a research issue. But it's one we have to take seriously, engage, and also tap into administrative data, data from stakeholders, from social partners, and use those. And I, I want to summarize it with these words, maybe confidence and credibility, that it can be done. So, uh, and, and inclusion is a reflection of that and also an objective of that credible um, path. I think we're coming here also to, to the, some results of the discussion from the first panel regarding the strategic planning and also the data. I would like to give the opportunity to the audience to ask a few questions. So I see Maria. Thank you, Tatiana. Thanks, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, talking about priorities, um, the, my question is probably a bit more for Matteo, um, but for all the panel. Let me do a little bit of advertising here. We did, um, within a high-level expert group for the European Commission, um, 
DG Employment, DG Connect a few years ago, we carried out a report and one of the recommendations was to um, invest in mental health for workers. We were talking about digital exhaustion and on that, which was particularly forward looking given that the year, bef the year after the pandemic struck and we are all digital exhausted. But I think, and, and this is something that is, as a public emergency uh, can be seen, I guess. But going to skills, we also, in the course of this conference, we also managed to talk about um, soft skills, the capacity of empathy, creativity, decision making, and blah, blah. So all this is particularly linked to mental health. And I think, I think uh, it's not the first time that I bang on this. I think it's important to recognize the policy emergency, then we need more funds to um, support people that cannot afford private health. And this is, I think, is a great priority for inclusion in labor market, particularly when there is a side effect of digital exhaustion on mental health, but also the importance of soft skills that require um, mental health to start with. So at the two opposite of the conditions, let's say, of the value chain in the labor market. And I want to know um, what are your views? I mean, what, what do we need in your views to make it a policy priority? Thank you. I mentioned since, uh, since we are uh, namely first. So regarding uh, mental health in, in particular, uh, I don't have the full spectrum of the policy initiatives, but I know that, for instance, the, co the commission is working on a, um, on an instrument regarding the, the right to disconnect uh, as related to telework. And you know, codifying that as a right, I think, is, uh, is a big step forward that helps. Obviously, it's you know, one, one of the measures. Uh, you mentioned uh, soft skills, uh, uh, et cetera. So I, I, have a, I have a take on this that you know, it's, uh, when we talk about soft skills and as we observe them in job advertisements and people telling us they're important, yes, we, we mean many different things by that. And one of the things we mean is actually working conditions. So these are methods of work. It's how you work with other people. And they're not necess and putting it necessarily as a term of skills sometimes put the, the burden of responsibility on the side of the worker, meaning you have to adapt, you have to be flexible. We've actually been conducting interviews with employers who wrote job advertisement to ask, what do you mean exactly when you ask for this, when you ask for this type of skills, etc. We heard from the management, we heard from HR, we heard from union representatives. The union told us when, when, what they mean by soft skills is, you know, they want someone who's docile. <laughs> and, you know, that was one person, one take, etc. And certainly they had their agenda and everyone else does. But this is not to diminish the importance because it really is. It, it really is important, I know, as Betty said yesterday, and um, uh, that things work together. But uh, we... Uh, it, 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 as I said, it's, it, it's also sometimes a matter of working conditions and methods of work and not just on individual abilities to be agreeable or, or even have certain, certain personality traits. And uh, so I think this also partially addresses your question on mental health. I mean, it's, uh, to some extent, it's also a consequence of working conditions. If I may just quickly add to this, I think the, t the topic is on the table, as Matteo said, the right to disconnect as a parliament resolution and examinations are ongoing this year, so the commission will come up with a proposal and probably issues you, you do mention relating to loneliness, mental health, or other impacts are not easy, but are certainly to be, to be assessed in that context. Uh, also, maybe there's an increasing attention to the well-being economy overall, in particular in the so-called Eighth Environmental Action Programme. There's an agreement uh, also supported a lot by, by, uh, by the co-legislators in the parliament in particular to, to include indicators, measures of well-being more generally um, in, in, our, in our analysis. So, yes. Okay, thank you. One very short question, please. <laughs> I, I'll try to make it short. I want to connect to the presentation both Matteo and Arthur. Uh, I mean, essentially, you know, you, you show that the discussion about skills and talent war is, is being debated in a sort of an individual level. And, and I sort of, you know, individual term, and I agree with that, but I think the problem is that it's, it, it's not. It's actually not even a European Union issue, it's actually a global issue. And that's one thing that I'm not seeing at all being discussed here is that, hey, you're going to train all of these ICT workers, but in five years, they will be working for companies in US. And in 10 years, they're gonna be working in companies in China. And that this whole concept of global, you know, war for talent, is going to hit the door 
of Europe as well. It's already hitting the door of Latin America. It's already happening in the U.S. within regions, like regions that have low cost of living. Traditionally, they're losing people because now they can work with companies in San Francisco and Boston everywhere. Look, it's, it's amazing to live in Europe. I will, I will live in Europe, and then I'm going to work with a company in the U.S. or somewhere else that is paying more. That is a problem that Europe is going to face pretty soon, if not already. And there's already policies in place that make it even harder because it's already hard to work, to live in Italy and work with a company in Germany, for example. So that, that talent flow is already a problem with, with the laws that exist. And I do think we are already in a different era. Pre-COVID, you know, we're not going back to that. And this whole global you know, talent war is there, uh, you know, and Europe has to deal with it. Can we do anything about it? Does anybody would like to reflect on this? <laughs> We have to produce a surplus. Deal <laughs> um, with the demographic change. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong in principle, and there also, I mean, the, the regional divergence was mentioned before. So maybe uh, some of these trends are also amenable to, to solving some of the divergences we have across regions, maybe, and help uh, people work from where they want within Europe or, or elsewhere. But yeah, work is going on in a talent pool. I don't go into this as part of the new innovation agenda. Maybe just to say that in our policy area, there's also <clears throat> a high-level group uh, currently working on the future of the welfare state in general. And some of the issues you mentioned of where, where you live, where do you work, and how does that relate to <coughs> financing and functioning of the future of the welfare state is also something high on the agenda for sure. Okay, let's wrap up. I would like to thank all our speakers and panelists for sharing their insights and views. So let's give them a round of applause. If you have more questions, please feel free to post them uh, during the coffee break. <laughs>